April 14, 1865 is remembered as the night of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. But in Washington, it was an evening of general treachery. There were evil men about. Lincoln was shot. Secretary of State William Seward was stabbed. General Ulysses S. Grant was targeted, but was fortunately out of town. Vice President Andrew Johnson was on the hit list, too. Johnson was offered tickets to attend the play at Ford's Theater, but turned them down. Uh, probably a good thing. But Lincoln assassin John Wilkes Booth knew exactly where the vice president would be spending the night. He assigned a co-conspirator to go to Johnson's suite at the Kirkwood boarding house. Johnson retires to his quarters at the Kirkwood house. He's completely unaware of anything that's going on. Uh, in fact, uh, sits up part of the night reading, then goes to bed. If all had gone according to plan, Johnson would have been awakened sometime later by a knock at the door, at which point a knife would have been plunged into his heart. But it never happened. The man assigned by Booth to assassinate Johnson lost his nerve, uh, started drinking, decided he wasn't going to go through with it. So the vice president was spared, and when Lincoln died of his wounds the following morning, Andrew Johnson became the first American president to gain the office because of an assassin's bullet. That's part of what will evolve into Johnson's difficulties. He assumes the presidency. He was not elected to it. And so Johnson is coming in as, a, as virtually a pretender to the throne. Number 17, Andrew Johnson, Democrat Union. 1865 to 1869, 56 years old, from Tennessee. Andrew Johnson was nothing like his martyred predecessor. Unlike Lincoln, he was a Southerner and a Democrat, and had at one point owned a small number of slaves. But during the Civil War, he was the only senator from a seceding state to remain with the Union, and he had been selected as Lincoln's running mate in 1864 to broaden the ticket's appeal. Nobody anticipated at all Johnson becoming president. If anyone had thought that might possibly happen, they certainly wouldn't have put him on the ticket. Johnson was regarded as stubborn or principled, depending on whether you agreed with him or not. Like Lincoln, he had risen from poverty to prominence through his own determination. This upward striving in Lincoln went along with the kind of wit and modesty and open-mindedness and ability to deal with all sorts of people. Somehow with Johnson, he has this closed-in personality. He's very self-oriented. He doesn't listen to other people. He doesn't care about other people. He doesn't have very many friends. Johnson's background and personality greatly influenced his management style. He had no formal education and had trained to be a tailor. He also had a righteous streak. Johnson was dogged and stubborn, inflexible. Once he took a position, uh, he was never willing to compromise it. He, he has a tendency to see conspiracies on all sides against him. He was thin-skinned about criticism. So in all of these respects, he differed sharply from Lincoln. For a model on how to run his new presidency, Johnson looked to a former president with whom he shared a home state and a very similar name, Andrew Jackson. One of Jackson's great quotations is, our federal union it must be preserved. And Johnson picked that up and used that throughout his career, and the argument can be made that he was the last Jacksonian. Like Jackson, Johnson believed he was the voice of the common man, or at least the common white man. He's probably the most racist president we've ever had, and uh, he thinks he talks about blacks as savages, barbarians, and he really thinks they should just go back to work on the plantation and leave the public sphere to whites. When Johnson took the oath of office, the Civil War was essentially over. Now it was up to the tailor from Tennessee to stitch the tattered Union back together. His entire legacy would be staked on the question of Reconstruction. Well, I think the Reconstruction crisis was the greatest crisis in American history other than the crisis of the Civil War itself. Because what was at issue was not simply bringing the South back into the Union, but defining the essence of the American nation. Who is going to be a citizen of the United States? What are the rights that citizens are to enjoy? Who is an American, basically? Among the most eager to learn about Johnson's policies were the so-called radical Republicans, 
the vocal, reform-minded wing of the party. Men like Pennsylvania Representative Thaddeus Stevens and Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, they believed the South should be punished and the freed slaves protected, made citizens, and given the right to vote. Johnson played the role very skillfully in those first few weeks. And the immediate reaction is, yes, we trust Johnson and we can deal with him. Then Congress leaves Washington not to come back again until December. So Johnson uh, has that wonderful window of opportunity there to take over as president. What Johnson did with his opportunity was to come up with his own presidential reconstruction plan. Many in the defeated South were prepared for the worst. In April 1865, the South was lay prostrate at the feet of the conquering North, and many Southerners then were so shell-shocked that they would have been willing to accept almost any terms of Reconstruction. Johnson came in thundering revenge and punishment to these same people, and in their despair, while, while they thought, oh my God, you know, this is what our fate is going to be. But Johnson had a pleasant surprise in store for the dispirited Southerners. They are a conquered region, but he doesn't want to treat them as a conquered region. These are his people, after all. Nobody knows for sure what Lincoln would have done, but Johnson's plan favored amnesty for most ex-Confederates and quick acceptance of the seceded states into the Union. The freed slaves got little protection. They weren't guaranteed citizenship or the right to vote. Johnson was on the wrong side of history, on the wrong side of morality, on the wrong side of politics. He just was unable to recognize that the Civil War had changed the nation, that the emancipation of the slaves carried with it some obligation to protect the basic rights of these emancipated slaves. When Congress comes back to town in December of 65, Johnson announces that the restoration of the South has been completed. And that is startling news to the members of Congress. Congress immediately started passing Reconstruction Acts of its own, beginning with an extension of the Freedmen's Bureau, a measure begun under Lincoln to aid the transition of blacks from slavery into freedom. Johnson vetoed it. And from that point on, that will be the story of the relationship between Congress and the president. Congress passes, Johnson vetoes. Congress passes, Johnson vetoes. Johnson's 29 presidential vetoes shattered the previous record of 12, which was set by his hero, Andrew Jackson. When you hitch your presidential leadership to the veto wagon, you're not going anywhere. And Johnson, stubborn and defiant that he was, refused to see that. Now it was Congress's turn to make history. Beginning with the Civil Rights Bill of 1866, they realized they had the votes to override Johnson's vetoes. Their record of overturning President Johnson 15 times still stands. Throughout 1866 and 1867, Congress hammered away at Johnson's authority. In March of 1867, they passed the Tenure of Office Act, limiting the president's ability to remove appointees without the Senate's consent. It was a trap, and Johnson couldn't resist the bait. He suspended and later dismissed his Secretary of War, a holdover from Lincoln's cabinet. Take no prisoners was his attitude. And of course, um, that inspired the other side to fight back in the same way, and that's why he was impeached. By violating the Tenure of Office Act, Johnson gave the radicals in Congress an excuse to get rid of him. Articles of impeachment were drafted. Opposition only made him more and more stubborn. He was unwilling to meet his critics halfway. He was unwilling to listen to criticism. So he just destroyed his own presidency. In February of 1868, the House of Representatives made an unprecedented move, voting to impeach the president. Their charges were flimsy at best and clearly politically motivated. Johnson's the target of a vast left-wing conspiracy. He thought the impeachment was an outrage. He said the people who are violating the Constitution, impeaching me for violating the Constitution, should be the other way around. A trial in the Senate would determine whether Johnson's misdeeds amounted to the high crimes and misdemeanors required by the Constitution to remove him from office. If two-thirds of the senators voted to convict him, the Johnson presidency would be over. Tickets to this trial were like getting tickets to the Super Bowl. Now, 
They were scalped outside the uh, Senate chambers. It was a matter of great entertainment. It was like a big athletic event. It was the social event in Washington. And uh, the women and all that finery and the diplomats, everybody came to the Senate to see what was going to go on. It was a circus, just as it was in 1999. In the end, Johnson avoided conviction and removal from office by a single vote. Chastened by his run-in with Congress, Johnson passed the rest of his term quietly. After returning home to Tennessee, he would later become the only former president to be elected to the Senate. At the end of the day, you have to admit that he was no Abraham Lincoln. But who was? And Johnson lived with that shadow over him his entire tenure as president. I think Johnson, in a way, discredited the presidency. His intransigence helped empower Congress to take a greater and greater role in formulating major national policy. The troublesome relationship between Andrew Johnson and the Congress had a lasting impact on the executive office. For the next 30 years, a series of relatively weak presidents would occupy the White House. Andrew Johnson did not attend a single day of school. He taught himself how to read. He was hailed as the victor of Vicksburg, the hero of Appomattox, the savior of the Union. If there had been paparazzi in the late 19th century, no American's picture would have been more coveted than that of General Ulysses S. Grant. There were no movie stars in that period of time. There were very few authors that were well known. There was no television. Grant was as close to a star celebrity in the United States in the late 1860s and 1870s as you could have had. Well, in 1868, there's no doubt but that Grant was the most popular man in the North. It was almost a shoe-in to become the Republican presidential candidate. I think enough people told him that he should be president that he kind of became convinced. Then why not become president if people are willing to make you president, right? Number 18, Ulysses Simpson Grant, Republican, 1869 to 1877, 46 years old, from Ohio. At the time, he was the youngest man ever to be elected president and the first West Pointer. He was also the first to be elected without winning a majority of the white vote. That's because blacks in the South were allowed to cast ballots for the first time, and roughly 700,000 did, 12% of the total vote. They voted almost, I think, to a man for Grant. They viewed him just as they had viewed Lincoln as central to their emancipation. Loyal to a fault, the silent general was humble and shy. As a soldier in the field, he would bathe in a closed tent so others wouldn't see him in the nude. He was also a surprisingly good artist. Some of his drawings and paintings still survive. Military heroes like Grant are supposed to cut a gallant figure in their uniforms, but descriptions of him range from rumpled to reeking of cigar smoke. Grant certainly was not a gallant figure. In fact, he was short, looked a little bit dumpy because of the way he carried himself. <laughs> Grant was pretty short and kind of schleppy, to use a modern phrase. He frequently had a cigar in his mouth, which made him look a little more disheveled. In addition to his smoking habit, 20 cigars a day, President Grant was an adrenaline junkie. In an era before automobiles, he relied on pure horsepower to satisfy his need for speed. In 1866, he won an impromptu drag race through Central Park against a coach carrying President Andrew Johnson. As president, he once got a speeding ticket for driving his horse-drawn carriage too fast down M Street. He paid a $20 fine. Not surprisingly, Grant's approach to the presidency was similar to his approach on the battlefield. He seemed to feel at the beginning, Grant, that the president was like a military commander. He had subordinates. The subordinates would be loyal to him. He had a tendency, however, to appoint cronies, relatives of his wife, old buddies from the army days to positions of power in his administration, which they then, in many cases, proceeded to abuse. In a way, Grant saw his presidency as a continuation of his service in the Civil War. When Grant was nominated for president, he 
said, let's resolve these questions that are left over from the war. Uh, let us have peace. Those simple, elegant words became his campaign slogan, let us have peace. As it turned out, Grant's administration was anything but peaceful. It had started off well enough. Most of the seceded states had been restored to the Union, and black voters, emboldened by the support of federal troops, had elected Republican governments in many southern states. But the lasting hatreds of war had not died at Appomattox. There were those in the North who wanted to punish the South, and those in the South who wanted to punish blacks. The Ku Klux Klan was really the terrorist wing of the Democratic Party at that time. There is a kind of an almost another civil war going on in the South. Terrorist groups are launching murder, assassination, whippings, beatings, burnings of buildings in order to undermine the governments there. What does the federal government do about this? Grant, working with Congress, essentially launched a war on terror. Using new powers granted to him by a series of anti-Klan laws, he sent federal troops to the hotbeds of violence in the South to round up Klansmen and even hold them without trial. Grant crushes the Klan. He succeeds. You can do that if you're willing to be pretty harsh. He crushes the Ku Klux Klan. Thanks to Grant's effort, 1872 was the most peaceful year the South had seen since the Civil War. But like the eye of a hurricane, the peace was a false calm for the president and for America. Late in Grant's first term, a spate of scandals began to emerge among his trusted subordinates, tarnishing the reputation of the hero of Appomattox and turning Grant's name into a synonym for corruption. It seemed to America that the president was asleep at the wheel. Oh my God, you've got the credit mobilier, you've got the whiskey ring, you've got people lining their pockets from the federal coffers. Where was Grant? Where was this great general? I think it's true. Grant didn't know the whiskey rings were going on, the Indian frauds were going on, the credit mobilier scandal was going on. There's no evidence that Grant personally profited from any of this stuff. But he also had a rather naive faith in his subordinates. Even though he wasn't personally involved, they put a taint on his administration because as another president said, the buck stops here. Despite the scandals, Grant's enduring popularity earned him a decisive re-election in 1872. His second term was marred by an escalation in Southern violence. Things began to fall apart after Grant was re-elected in 1872. Uh, one Southern state after another was recaptured by the Democrats. Violence continued. During his first term, Grant didn't hesitate to quell violence in the South by sending federal troops. But the political climate of his second term would not allow for such bold executive action. In 1873, an economic depression in the North contributed to a shift in public opinion about the problems of Reconstruction in the South. People didn't want to hear about it anymore. They didn't want to pay for it anymore. Americans do have short attention spans. And the idea of an endless occupation of the South very few people had stomach for it. So by 1875, when the governor of Mississippi asked for federal troops to end an outbreak of electoral violence, Grant failed to act. By the end of his presidency, Grant is sitting by without doing anything as one after another of these southern governments are basically overthrown by terrorist groups and Reconstruction is coming to an end. Reconstruction wasn't Grant's only challenge. Another confounding domestic issue of the day was Indian affairs. Grant came into office hoping to pursue a peace policy towards the Indians. But it doesn't happen. There is no peace. There is more war. It was during Grant's second term that George Armstrong Custer and his 7th Cavalry were annihilated by Indians on the banks of the Little Bighorn River. Custer's last stand was the exception. Usually it was the Indians who were massacred. Tragically, during his administration, conflict not only continued between the army and the settlers in the West and the Indians, but actually intensified. In the end, President Grant is remembered more for his magnificent failures than his well-intentioned efforts. Grant's administration is considered one of the real failed administrations in, in American history often ranks right at the bottom 
just above Richard Nixon. But Grant's stock is rising in recent years. In a lot of ways, he is not remembered and not credited for the really astonishing steps toward black equality that occurred during his two terms in office. It is this effort, endorsed by a man of war who fought for peace, attempted but never fully realized during his administration, that may be the true legacy of Grant's presidency. Ulysses Grant hated hunting, despised harsh treatment of animals, and the sight of blood made him physically ill. In 1876, the Republican Party was looking for someone to counter the corrupt image of the scandal-ridden Grant years. Affable and morally scrupulous, Ohio Governor Rutherford B. Hayes was the perfect anti-Grant. His personality was why he got the nomination, partly. Hayes promised to be a different type of president who would make his own decisions, appoint people on the basis of merit rather than uh, uh, to pay back a favor. One observer at the time called him a third-rate non-entity whose only recommendation is that he is obnoxious to no one. Hayes was lucky even to be alive to run for president in 1876. His stint in the Civil War nearly killed him. He was wounded five times and had four horses shot out from under him. Some would later call the election of 1876 between Hayes and New York Governor Samuel Tilden the last battle of the Civil War. Once again, Hayes barely emerged intact. It was a bitter, hard-fought campaign, and on election night, it looked as if Tilden had won. Hayes went to bed assuming he had lost because Tilden was something like 260,000 votes ahead, which in modern figures was about 1.3 million. Like George W. Bush in 2000, Hayes lost the popular vote. The tally in the Electoral College also seemed to favor Tilden, but it was close. And as in the 2000 election, results from several states were in dispute. Awaiting the outcome of the election at his estate in Ohio, Hayes was telling the local papers that he had lost. Finally, they got word to him, quit saying he'd lost the election because we're, you know, we're going we're gonna to win it. After four months of accusations, negotiations, and recounts, both sides finally agreed to allow a specially appointed electoral commission to settle the matter. Voting eight to seven along party lines, the commission gave all three disputed states and the election to Rutherford B. Hayes. The last hurdle blocking Hayes' path to the White House was confirmation by the House of Representatives. Democrats threatened to filibuster, but their opposition evaporated. Historians would later speculate of a so-called great compromise in which Hayes made concessions in exchange for the presidency. While it seems likely that a backroom deal was made, it's not clear what was promised. For Hayes, this was a precarious way to begin a presidency. His detractors saddled him with unflattering nicknames. He was called uh, his fraudulency. Uh, or the great usurper. Rutherford Hayes. Not exactly the moniker you want to carry into your administration. On March 3rd, 1877, Hayes was sworn in in the White House Red Room. The first president to take the oath of office inside the executive mansion. Hayes took his public oath of office two days later on the steps of the Capitol. Number 19, Rutherford B. Hayes, Republican, 1877 to 1881, 54 years old, from Ohio. Hayes was the first president to have a telephone installed in the White House. He and his wife Lucy are also credited with filling in some crucial gaps in the White House portrait collection by commissioning paintings of former presidents Jefferson, Adams, and Jackson. Hayes was a Harvard Law School graduate with a sunny disposition and a reputation for honesty. Hayes definitely was one of these people who came into office and just was crushed to realize the pettiness and the absurdity and the day in and day out dealing with human foibles, office seekers, uh, grievances. The Hayes White House was subdued. Lucy Hayes believed in temperance. She was called Lemonade Lucy. <laughs> because uh, she banned liquor from the White House. And Hayes wasn't so strong on that, but he went along with his wife. 
The joke was that at, at state functions in the White House, the water flowed like wine. President Hayes showed temperance in his management style as well. He approached everything from kind of a scholarly, legalistic approach. His style of leadership was to gather the information, consult the proper advisors, make a decision. Once a decision is made, try not to look back and be decisive. When Hayes took office, the country was still dealing with the legacy of post-Civil War reconstruction. Federal troops were stationed in the state houses of South Carolina and Louisiana to protect black-supported Republican governments from takeover by the Democrats, who were mostly ex-Confederates. In the most controversial act of Hayes's presidency, he ordered the removal of the troops from the state houses, clearing the way for Democratic takeover of the last two southern states still under Republican rule. It was the symbolic end of Reconstruction. Some historians see this as a consummation of the backroom deal made during the disputed election. In the so-called Great Compromise, Republicans allegedly agreed to give up control of the South if the Democrats would rescind their opposition to Hayes becoming president. Basically, you've got an exchange. Republican control of the White House in exchange for Democratic control of the state governments of now the entire South. Hayes has been vilified for his complicity in the deal, agreeing to end Reconstruction in exchange for the presidency. But historians point out that the Great Compromise of 1877 isn't exactly what it appears. The election of Hayes is taken very often as the ending of Reconstruction, but Hayes represented the faction of the Republican Party which wanted to end Reconstruction. And his nomination shows that the Republican Party was already retreating from further intervention in the South to protect the rights of black people. So the bargain or the compromise of 1877, which finally puts Hayes in the White House and is sort of the point at which Reconstruction ends, is an important moment, but it's also the culmination of a trajectory which has taken place for several years before that. Hayes was already interested in a new approach to the South. He was convinced that the return of civilian rule would bring with it a return of civility. Hayes believed that if what was often called the best man, the better sort, the well-to-do Southern whites came back into power, even as Democrats, that they would, in a sort of paternalistic way, protect blacks from violence and recognize their basic rights. He was shocked when that didn't happen. This was probably the biggest disappointment to Rutherford Hayes because he really felt betrayed by the former Confederate leaders because they were supposed to be officers and gentlemen. Regardless of how the decision had been made, under Hayes's watch, the window closed on Reconstruction, dooming blacks in the South to years of segregation and deprivation, and keeping the old Confederacy a white man's country for another hundred years. For better or worse, the great issues of the age had been settled. And as the Civil War faded into memory, the reformers in Hayes's party were in search of another defining issue. Some people thought that civil service reform would be as important as anti-slavery had been. I have never quite understood that. The civil service meant government jobs, like postal officials and tax collectors. These positions were used by politicians to exert influence and extort cash. There's no income tax. One of the largest ways of the federal government to collect taxes was on customs duties. And most of U.S. imports and exports came through or went out of the Port of New York. So the collector of the Port of New York was a really significant position in the federal bureaucracy at this time. The New York Custom House was the biggest source of patronage in the country. And consequently, it tended to be quite corrupt. Appointments to the Custom House, including the position of Chief Collector, were controlled by New York's corrupt political machine, namely the so-called Republican stalwarts led by Senator Roscoe Conkling. In one of the few decisive moments of his presidency, Hayes removed the head of the Custom House, who was a Conkling crony, and replaced him with someone of merit. But the deposed crony would not have long to lick his wounds. His name? Chester A. Arthur who, against all odds, would become president himself within three years. 
In the final year of his presidency, Hayes became the first sitting president to travel to the West Coast, a move he hoped would bring unity to the country. Despite some calls for him to run again, he honored a campaign pledge not to seek a second term. He said, no, he had enough. He really didn't like the presidency very much. In his typical positive way, Hayes was quite proud of the accomplishments of his administration. He thought he was the best president since John Quincy Adams with the exception of Lincoln. Hayes retired to his home in Fremont, Ohio, where he spent the last years of his life working tirelessly for education reform and civil rights for black Americans. In doing so, he set a standard for future ex-presidents. Three different presidents occupied the White House in 1881, Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield, and Chester Arthur. In 1880, Ulysses S. Grant wanted back in the game. Voters had forgiven the beloved general for the corruption of his first two terms, and his image had been rehabilitated by a triumphant world tour where he was greeted as a hero by everyone from diplomats to commoners. So he tried to get his party's nomination, but instead, another Ohio general, James Garfield, emerged at the Republican convention. It was he, not Grant, who won the nomination and then the presidency. Number 20, James A. Garfield, Republican, 1881, 49 years old, from Ohio. He was the first former college president and only preacher to hold the office. And he was the last person to move directly from the House of Representatives to the White House. Garfield was a large, outgoing man. He was well-read and not bored at all by the intricacies of policymaking. He's what today you would call a policy wonk. He was someone who would take an issue, for instance, like the tariff, and fill in notebooks with detailed calculations about how the tariff works and how different industries work. He's someone who, in the summer of 1880, um, at least four times he would skip away from sessions of the House of Representatives to go watch baseball, professional baseball being played on the Washington Mall. As a politician, Garfield was known to be a bit of a waffler. It was something of a weakness that he proved to be not very decisive. He didn't seem to want to ruffle any feathers. He tried to make everyone happy. And in effect, he made no one happy. Garfield's first job as president was to dole out political appointments. It was a notoriously corrupt process. But the scandals among Ulysses Grant's appointees, who were mostly his cronies, had contributed to an outcry for merit-based appointments. This issue of civil service reform had been left at Garfield's doorstep, and he decided to challenge the old system by taking on powerful New York Senator Roscoe Conkling over who should be appointed chief collector of the Port of New York. Conkling had traditionally filled this important civil service post with his own cronies. Now, as an analogy, imagine today, for instance, that the senator from the state of Virginia would point to the fact that the Pentagon is on the Virginia side of the Potomac River. Therefore, he should have control of who is the Secretary of Defense and all of his staff. It was that kind of claim, which at the time was actually very common. Garfield decided to challenge this political tradition by appointing a rival of Conkling's to be chief collector. It was a risky move for the new president. But despite a firestorm of opposition, Garfield held firm, and Conkling ended up resigning from the Senate in protest. Garfield wins, which surprised a lot of people. That was the beginning of the end of Conkling's machine and the old spoil system. Of course, Garfield didn't live long enough to see all the fruits of that victory. The series of events that would lead to the untimely death of President Garfield began in the early days of his presidency. When Garfield moved into the White House in his first days as president, he was barraged by questions of patronage and appointments. The White House itself was a very open forum. Anyone could walk in. There was no Secret Service protection at the time. Every day, Garfield would visit with office seekers. And while Garfield tried to limit himself to picking the office heads or the major positions, he couldn't avoid being barraged by the legions of job seekers. 
One of these job seekers was a man named Charles Guiteau. He was a strange fellow who had spent the campaign season of 1880 hanging around Republican Party headquarters in New York and now felt he was owed a diplomatic appointment by the Garfield administration. He identified himself strongly with a faction of the party called the Stalwarts, which included Senator Conkling and Garfield's vice president, Chester A. Arthur. Yeah, he had at one point shook Arthur's hand and at another point made his way into Garfield's waiting area in the White House. But he was seen as somewhat of a joke. Upset that the Garfield administration ignored his requests for a diplomatic appointment, angry at Garfield's slight to Conkling, and believing he had a calling from God, Guiteau set out to remove the president. On July 2, 1881, Guiteau stalked Garfield to the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station in Washington and shot him twice. One bullet grazed the president's arm, the other lodged in his torso. As the police hauled Guiteau away, he declared, I did it. I will go to jail. I am a stalwart, and Arthur will be president. Charles Guiteau has earned the everlasting moniker of a disappointed office seeker, sometimes a disgruntled office seeker. But Charles Guiteau is not a disgruntled or disappointed office seeker. He's insane. Garfield didn't die right away. As he lingered, the assassin's bullet still in his body, every change in his condition was telegraphed across the country. Sometimes he would improve and almost look like he would uh, recover. But during that period, the nation really rallied to support the president. And he had far greater popularity after he was shot than before. We know now that Garfield may well have been killed by his own doctors or the efforts of his doctors to save him. They would stick instruments and fingers up into Garfield's back. The uh, medical care was, was atrocious, even for that era. In August, Garfield wrote a letter to his mother back in Ohio, telling her not to worry. It is true I am still weak and on my back, he wrote, but I am gaining every day and need only time and patience to bring me through. On September 19th, 79 days after being shot and only six months after taking office, the president died. The only legacy of Garfield's brief presidency was his battle against the New York political machine. The real accomplishment of Garfield in the end, had he lived to build on it, was that he in fact took a stand against that system. He in fact finally said no to the most powerful boss of his time on a question of patronage and made it stick. Garfield would become a martyr for the civil service reform movement. It would be up to his vice president, Chester Arthur, himself a product of the New York political machine, to continue the fight. During the two months that President Garfield lay dying from his gunshot wounds, Congress was out of session. It is said the country continued to run smoothly nonetheless. In 1881, Chester A. Arthur completed the most unlikely of political comebacks, only three years after being removed in disgrace from his post as chief collector of the New York Custom House, he now found himself, by virtue of assassination, President of the United States. Number 21, Chester A. Arthur, Republican, 1881 to 1885, 51 years old, from New York. Arthur may have been a native of Vermont, but he was indisputably a New Yorker. He was someone who could pick out a good bottle of wine. He ate very well. He was a gourmand. He enjoyed drinking at, at the finest restaurants and in the most exclusive clubs. Arthur was a bit of a dandy, a bit of a peacock. He was incredibly meticulous about how he dressed. He bought the latest fashions. And he was able to live a Gilded Age life. Unlike many of the figures of that era, Chet Arthur did not have the full beard but he did have uh, full sideburns, which was certainly a distinguishing feature. Arthur looked like a president. In 1880, when he was elected vice president, Arthur had celebrated in his own way with a shopping spree at Brooks Brothers. In addition to being a high living New York party animal, Arthur was also an avid fisherman. He took frequent fishing trips with his pal, New York Senator and political boss, Roscoe Conkling, 
Arthur's management style was an offshoot of his personality. Arthur did not like to work hard. He is somebody who was routinely described as strolling into the Oval Office at 10, meeting with people, signing some papers, going for a ride or a walk at around 4 in the afternoon, taking a nap, and having dinner quietly with family and friends. Some people might perceive that to be kind of a lazy man's uh, presidency, but uh, actually is very efficient during those hours. But then after 4 o'clock, he figured that it was time now to relax. A White House staffer would later recall that President Arthur never did today what he could put off until tomorrow. Unlike most presidents of his era, moving into the White House felt like a social demotion to Arthur. Arthur came into the White House and says, I will not live in this house. And Arthur insists that the White House become renovated, and they spend many months renovating. And one of the people that he employs to renovate the White House is a very young Lewis Comfort Tiffany. With the White House restored, Arthur set about restoring the faded Washington party scene. His wife had died in 1880, so the president's sister was his social hostess. Wine, champagne, hard liquor made a reappearance in the White House under Chet Arthur. And he brings that style to the White House. Garfield didn't have enough time to really place his stamp on the Washington social scene. And the Hayes had not exactly wowed anyone with their social panache. A product of the corrupt New York machine, Arthur knew that he had to convince the country he was more than just a political hack. To do this, he would have to make a painful break with his old faction and its leader, his dear friend, Roscoe Conkling. Much to the chagrin of Conkling and his faction, Chet Arthur really became a reformer, one of the great ironies in American presidential history. The man who was a product of the spoil system of New York uh, fought against it. It is the Nixon going to China syndrome. Usually the representative of the old system is in the best position to change that system. In 1883, Arthur signed the Pendleton Act, which was the first strong piece of civil service reform legislation. As one former colleague from New York observed, he is no longer Chet Arthur, he is the president. The other important achievement of the Arthur administration was a much needed upgrading of the United States Navy. The Navy by this point was considered to be an international joke. It had maybe three ships capable of standing up against the modern navies of the world. And the president took some action and began the building of a modern fleet of steel ships with rifled guns on their decks. So the only way you fight the Spanish-American War in 1898 is by having a navy that had been based on foundations established by Arthur in 1882 and 1883. Having risen to the presidency through assassination, Arthur would never get the opportunity to win his own term. Denied the party's nomination in 1884, he died two years later from a kidney ailment that he had secretly battled throughout his administration. Arthur ends up being a much better president than most people had expected him to. He was a competent president in a time when competency was really all that most people either expected or wanted from the presidency. Only 20 years removed from the Civil War, it was remarkable how much the presidency had changed. The strength of the office had been tested by assassinations, scandals, impeachment, and a highly disputed election. By the late 1800s, the presidency didn't seem to matter much and a good deal of executive power had been ceded to Congress. But in the years to come, the men destined to inherit the presidency would reassert the powers lost during these years and turn America into a major player on the world stage.